Today we're going to have the first in a two-part series on matrix limits. But first, let's review the concepts of multiplicity of eigenvalues. Let's say that V is a vector space with some basis beta. Let T be a linear transformation from V to V, and A be its matrix representation with respect to this basis beta. First, let's assume that T has k distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda sub k. This means that our characteristic polynomial f of t factors as t minus lambda 1 to some exponent m sub 1 times t minus lambda sub k to some exponent m sub k. We'll say that the exponents m sub j are the multiplicities of the eigenvalues lambda sub j. Observe that the sum of these multiplicities must be the dimension of the vector space, that is m1 plus m2 plus m sub k must equal to the degree of f, which is n. Also recall that if lambda is an eigenvalue for t, then there must exist a non-zero vector v in a certain null space. E sub lambda, that is the null space of the linear operator t minus lambda iv, is just a collection of those vectors lowercase v, such that t applied to lowercase v is lambda times lowercase v. We call this subspace the eigenspace of t corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. We have a few properties about the eigenspace we'd like to state. As before, say that t is a linear transformation and that it has k distinct eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda sub k. We'll denote m sub i as the multiplicity of each of these eigenvalues. The dimension of the eigenspace e sub lambda i is between 1 and the multiplicity m sub i. The eigenspaces only intersect in one point. That is, as long as i is different from j, e sub lambda i intersects e sub lambda j just at the origin, namely the zero vector 0 sub v. Say that each capital S sub i is a linearly independent subset of the eigenspace e sub lambda i, then the union s over the s sub i's is also a linearly independent subset of the vector space v. Finally, t is diagonalizable if and only if the dimension of each eigenspace is as large as possible. That is, the dimension of each e sub lambda i is equal to the multiplicity m sub i for every i. Indeed, t is diagonalizable. If t is diagonalizable, then we can let beta just be the union of the bases for each of the e sub lambda i. Then beta is an ordered basis consisting of the eigenvectors of t. Before we go further, we'd like to ask a couple of motivating questions based on what we've seen up to this point. Let's consider an n by n square matrix capital A. We know that to find the exact values of the eigenvalues lambda, we must compute the roots of a certain degree in polynomial f of t. Of course, this is the characteristic polynomial. But of course, this is a lot of work to compute the determinant of a matrix. Instead, is there a way we can find an approximate value of the eigenvalues? Moreover, must the roots lambda be real numbers, or should they lie in a different set? We'll give an example here to exemplify what we're thinking. Consider the following 4 by 4 matrix A. We can compute that the eigenvalues are 3, 5, 7, and 9. However, let's change the values of the matrix A just a little bit. We'll keep the same values along the main diagonal, that is 3, 5, 7, and 9, but just off of the main diagonal, let's say instead of having zeros, maybe they'll vary a little bit from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. Then actually, if we did the same exact work of computing the exact value of the eigenvalues, we would see that the eigenvalues are very close to being the same numbers 3, 5, 7, and 9. In this case, they're approximately 2.95, 5.04, 6.97, and 9.03. In order to determine where the eigenvalues must lie, we're going to introduce a new set of numbers called the complex numbers. 
Let's put all of this in context by giving some definitions. Recall that the natural numbers is the set of whole numbers. This consists of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. However, we don't have to choose 0 to be a natural number. Indeed, some books define natural numbers just to be the positive integers. The integers, of course, should be the positive and negative whole numbers. So the integers consist of 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so forth. Typically, we use the notation z to denote the integers. This is inspired by the German word zahlen, which means a number. Next, we have the rational numbers. This would be the collection of quotients p over q, where p and q are integers. We'll always use q, that is quotients, to denote the rational numbers. To, the po to this point in the course, we've been looking at the real numbers, which of course we denote by capital R. For example, the square root of 2, the number e, and the number pi are examples of real numbers. Today we're going to introduce the collection of complex numbers, which we'll denote by capital C. This will be numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and i is formally the square root of minus 1. Here's a diagram that explains how all of these sets are related to each other. In the very middle, you'll see the natural numbers that consists of whole numbers such as 0 and 1. Slightly larger than that, we have the integers, which consist of even negative numbers, such as negative 1 and negative 2. That is encompassed by the rational numbers q, which consists of numbers such as negative 7 over 11 and 1.3333, 3 repeating, which of course is the same as 4 thirds. That inside, sits inside of the real numbers, which consists of numbers such as the square root of 2, e, and pi. And finally, all of this sits inside of the largest set that we'll consider, the complex numbers, which consists of numbers such as i, which is the square root of minus 1, and 1 plus i square root of 3, where 1 and square root of 3 are both real numbers. We're going to be interested in operations with the complex numbers. So let's first consider a geometric interpretation of what these operations will be. When we have a complex number a plus bi, we can actually view this as being plotted in two dimensions. So a plus bi really consists of a real part, namely the number a, which we think of as moving along the x-axis, and an imaginary part, which is the number b. b we view as moving along the y-axis. So a plus bi really is the same as a point a comma b sitting in the real plane. We can also discuss addition of complex numbers. Because we view a complex number as a vector in the real plane, R2, we can really view addition of complex numbers the same as addition of vectors. So for example, if we'd like to add the complex number 3 plus 4i to the complex number minus 1 plus i, then first we'll add along the x direction 3 minus 1, which is 2. Next we'll add along the y direction. 4 plus 1 is 5. So the sum of these complex numbers should be the complex number 2 plus 5i. The next operation that we'll consider today will be complex conjugates. If we have a complex number a plus bi, we'll consider its complex conjugate to just be the reflection over the x-axis. So a plus bi will reflect to become a minus bi. And finally, we'll be interested in the magnitude of a complex number. Because we view complex numbers as points in the plane, we can view the magnitude as just the length of this vector. So the magnitude of a plus bi is the length of the vector a comma b, which is just the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now let's put all of this in one place and formally discuss the properties of complex numbers that we will be interested in for the next several lessons. As before, we will let i denote the square root of minus 1. If you will, it's just the root of the polynomial x squared plus 1. We'll denote a complex number z as a number in the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. And we'll denote capital C, 
or boldface C as the collection of such complex numbers. The first big theorem is that the complex numbers under addition and multiplication forms a field. We'll say in just a moment what we mean by this. The following statement is beyond the scope of this course, but it explains why we've introduced complex numbers in the first place. This is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. It states that every polynomial with coefficients in the complex numbers has a root lambda also in the complex numbers. For this course, here's why we care about this. Let's say that A is an n by n matrix with entries that are complex numbers. Then this characteristic polynomial f of t always has a root lambda, which is a complex number. So this answers our first motivating, one of our motivating questions. We know that the roots in general may not be real numbers, but we can always find a root that is a complex number. Let's give a very quick sketch of the theorem we've stated. That is that our complex numbers form a field. In order to show that we have a field, we actually must show that 10 axioms are true. For the sake of time today, we're not going to worry about explaining these 10 axioms, but at least we'll sketch how you might actually prove these 10 axioms. Given two complex numbers x, which is a plus bi, and y, which is c plus di, we'll define the sum x plus y as we did with the vectors. We'll have a real part, a plus c, and an imaginary part, b plus d. We'll also define the product of two complex numbers in a rather strange way, but the concept here is that i squared is negative 1. A time, x times y will have a real part, ac minus bd, and it will have an imaginary part, ad plus bc. Using these two definitions, it's relatively straightforward to show that six of our ten axioms are true. We'll define the additive identity 0 as 0 plus 0i, which we'll really identify as being the origin inside of the plane. Similarly, the multiplicative identity, the number 1, will identify as 1 plus 0i. So, so we find that two more axioms are true. The additive inverse of a plus bi will be defined as negative a plus a negative b times i, but now the multiplicative inverse is a little bit trickier. We have to show that 1 over a plus bi is also a number in the form c plus di for some real numbers c and d. The way that we can show this is if we have 1 over a plus bi, let's multiply the numerator and denominator of this fraction by the complex conjugate a minus bi. Then the numerator of this fraction becomes a minus bi, but the denominator now is a real number, namely a squared plus b squared. So this does show that the inverse of a complex number a plus bi is another complex number. It will have real part a over a squared plus b squared and an imaginary part negative b over a squared plus b squared. This shows that the final axiom, final two axioms are true. Let's give a couple of examples to explain how the fundamental theorem of algebra works. For example, let's say that f of t is a polynomial of degree 1. This means we can write it in the form a0t plus a1t plus a0 for some complex numbers a1 and a0. Since they are complex numbers, let's just write a1 as a plus bi and a0 as c plus di. We know that the root of f of t is negative a0 over a1. So using the trick that we explained earlier, we can write this complex number lambda as having real part negative ac plus bd over a squared plus b squared and imaginary part negative ad minus bc over a squared plus b squared. Hence, for our polynomial of degree 1, there does exist a complex number such that f of lambda equals 0. Now let's consider a polynomial of degree 2. Here we'll write our f of t as a2 t squared plus a1 t plus a0 for some complex numbers a2, a1, and a0. For the moment, let's denote the complex numbers a plus bi as negative a1 over twice a2, and we have our so-called discriminant in terms of c plus di. It's straightforward to check that the root we would have corresponding to the 
quadratic equation, the quadratic formula, we can express in terms of A, B, C, and D in the way that you see here on your screen. It's a rather complicated formula, but what this simply says is we can always express the root of a quadratic polynomial having complex coefficients in terms of a complex number. Using all of this today, we're going to discuss the concept of a p-norm. First, we'll define it for vectors. Let's say that C is the collection of complex numbers. We've already discussed the concept of the absolute value of a complex number, a plus bi, as the square root of a squared plus b squared. Let's fix the number p between 1 and infinity. And yes, we will let p equal infinity. For any n-dimensional vector, we'll define the p-norm as the following row number. When p is equal to 1, we mean the sum of the absolute values of the x sub j's. Recall that each x sub j is a complex number, so the absolute value is defined at the top of the screen. When p is between 1 and infinity, we'll define the p-norm as the pth root of the sum of the p powers of the components of our vector. So this is the sum, j goes from 1 to n, the absolute value of x sub j raised to the p, and then we'll take the pth root of that sum. When p is equal to infinity, we'll define the p-norm as the maximum of the absolute values of each of the components of our vector. When p is equal to 1, we call this the Manhattan distance. When p is equal to 2, we will call this the Euclidean norm. And when p is equal to infinity, we'll call this the Chebyshev norm. Let's give an example of this rather strange definition. First, just to recall, we've reminded you here at the top of the screen. Let's say for the moment that n is equal to 2, and let's consider this vector x, which has components x sub 1 as 3 plus 4i, and x sub 2 as 0 plus 12i. We can compute that the absolute values of the components are 5 and 12, respectively. When p is equal to 1, its Manhattan length is just the sum of the absolute values of the components. So the Manhattan length of this vector x is simply 17. When p is equal to 2, the Euclidean length is now the square root of the sums of the squares. So in this case, the Euclidean length for our vector x is 13. Finally, let's say that p is equal to infinity. The Chebyshev length is the maximum of the absolute values of the components of our vector, so the Chebyshev length of our vector x is now 12. Let's try to give a geometric interpretation of these various norms. Here you see a map of the city Manhattan in New York. You'll see here that if we have two points, one at the lower left-hand part of your screen and the other at the upper right-hand part of your screen, the distance between these two points in the Euclidean sense will be the blue line. This will look like the sums of the squares and then we take the square root. However, if we were walking along the city streets in Manhattan, we couldn't just simply fly over the buildings in this way. We can only walk along city blocks. So instead, you would see the red line, which explains how we would be allowed to walk. The total length of the red line is what we call the Manhattan distance. So when p is equal to 1, you see the red line. But when p is equal to 2, you would see the blue line. On the other hand, let's consider when p is equal to infinity, that is the Chebyshev distance. The Chebyshev distance is also sometimes called the chessboard distance because it would explain, for example, if you were playing chess, how many moves it would take for the, for the piece king to move to any of the spots you see here. So if the king only moves one space on the chessboard, then you see the number one. There, moving one space gives us a distance of one. Where you see the numbers two, the chess, the king piece would have to move twice, two times, in order to get to that spot. So again, the number here explains how many moves the king would have to make to move to that spot on the chessboard.
And this number is exactly what we're calling the Chebyshev distance. Here's another geometric interpretation. Let's say that we have a vector in the plane R2. We'll call it x comma y. What we'd like to do is plot what a circle would look like. Remember that a circle will be defined as the set of points x comma y such that x squared plus y squared equals 1. However, there's really nothing special about the exponent 2. We can change this exponent to any number p. When p is equal to 2, we do have a circle. This will be the center that you see on your screen. When p is slightly larger, maybe when p is equal to roughly 3, or p is equal to roughly 4, then you see how this circle gets warped a little bit to a square. And as p gets larger and larger, that is p is equal to infinity, we then have the Chebyshev distance, and we can say we really do find a square. On the other hand, if we start at p is equal to 2 and get smaller, maybe p is about the square root of 2, 1.4, p is equal to 1, this would now be the Manhattan distance, or even if p becomes less than 1, you can now see how you get a weird-looking inverted type of a square. All of these would be generalized examples of a circle generalizing from the case when p is equal to 2. We'll quickly state a few properties about this so-called p-norm. Let's say that p is a number between 1 and infinity, and we'll let q be the corresponding complement. So for example, if p is equal to 2, then q will be equal to 2 because 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 equals 1. We have the following properties. First, we have positivity. That is, the p-norm of any vector x is always greater than or equal to 0. Next, we have non-degeneracy. That is, the p-norm of a vector x is 0 if and only if x itself is the 0 vector. Third, we have multiplicativity. Let's say that x is a vector and c is a scalar. Then c times x, of course, is another vector. And in fact, the p-norm of c times x is the absolute value of the scalar c times the p-norm of the vector x. Next, we have Holder's inequality. Let's say that we have two vectors, x and y, and they each have components xj and y sub j. Then the sum of the absolute value of the product, xj times yj, remember the xj and yj are just complex numbers, is less than or equal to the product of the norms. But here we have the p-norm of x times the q-norm of y. Again, remember that 1 over p plus 1 over q is 1. And finally, we have Minkowski's inequality. This says that the p-norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the p-norm of x plus the p-norm of y. As we mentioned just a moment ago, we have these complemented moduli. That is, p and q are both chosen so that 1 over p plus 1 over q is 1. For example, if p is equal to 1, then q would have to be infinity. If p is equal to infinity, q would have to be 1. If p is equal to 2, then q would also have to be 2. So for the moment, let's consider the cases when p and q are both equal to 2. Then Holder's inequality, as we've said it before, really is the same as what we'll call the cauchy bunyakowski schwartz inequality. We're going to come back and discuss the CBS inequality quite a bit over the next couple of weeks, so we just mentioned it today as a way to introduce it. Minkowski's inequality is the same as the triangle inequality. This is one that we've seen for vectors starting at the very beginning here of this course. So when you think of the Holder inequality, this is just a generalization of the cauchy bunyakowski schwartz which again we'll come back to over the next couple of weeks. Whereas Minkowski's inequality is just the generalization of the triangle inequality. Now let's use all of this to define the p-norm of a matrix. Let's say that A is any M by N matrix. We'll define the p-norm in the following rather strange way. It's what's called the supremum of the ratio of the p-norm of A times x divided by the p-norm of x for any vector x that is not the origin. This is a rather strange definition, so let's first try to explain why we're making such a definition. 
First, observe that if x is not the zero vector, then we found before that its p-norm is not the zero as a real number. So the ratio p-norm of a times x divided by the p-norm of x is a well-defined non-negative number. To be rather explicit, if a is an m by n matrix and x is an n-dimensional vector, then a times x will be an m-dimensional vector. So now we can consider the ratio, the p-norm of a times x, divided by the p-norm of x as the formula you see here on your screen. This quantity, the p-norm of the matrix A, is actually the supremum over all ratios. Really, what we mean by this is this p-norm of a matrix is basically the largest ratio, p-norm of A times x divided by the p-norm of x, that we can possibly find. In fact, we're actually choosing this bizarre definition, the p-norm of a matrix, such that the p-norm of A times x is less than or equal to the p-norm of A times the p-norm of x for all vectors x. So if you'd like to know why we're making this weird definition, it really comes down to this inequality at the very bottom of the screen. Actually, this proposition here explains really the reason why we're making this definition. We have the following properties. First, the p-norm of a matrix A is always non-negative, and the p-norm of a matrix is zero if and only if A is the zero matrix. For any scalar C, the p-norm of C times A is the absolute value of our scalar C times the p-norm of A. We also have Minkowski's inequality, but for p-norms. The p-norm of A plus B is less than or equal to the p-norm of A plus the p-norm of B. But here's really the reason why we've made these definitions. We have the following values. That is, the infinity norm of A is this value rho of A, which is the max of the sums rho sub i of A. Similarly, the one norm of a matrix A is equal to nu of A, which is the max of the V sub j's, where the V sub j's are the sums you see here as well. Moreover, if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then the absolute value of our complex number lambda is less than or equal to each of the p-norms of A. In particular, it's less than or equal to the minimum of the one norm of A and the infinity norm of A. Of course, the one norm is what we're calling nu of A, and the infinity norm is what we're calling rho of A. Now let's step back for a minute to figure out what is this last part of the proposition. Again, say that A is an M by N matrix. Recall that A sub I J is the entry on rho I in column J. Let's define rho sub i of a as the sum of the entries in rho i of a. Then we'll denote rho of a as the max of these rho sub i's, and we'll call this the rho sum of a. Similarly, let's let nu sub j of a be the sum of the absolute values of the entries in column j. We then have nu of a as the max of these sums. We'll denote nu of a as the column sum of a. Observe that, again, rho i of a is the sum over the entries in rho i, where nu sub j is the sum over the entries in column j. We use both of these to give a crude estimate for any eigenvalue lambda. Again, rho of a is the max of the rho of i's, nu of a is the max of the nu of i's, and each eigenvalue lambda in absolute value is less than both rho of a and nu of a. Let's give an example of all of this. Let's consider a four by four matrix, as you see here on your screen. In fact, this is the same matrix that we began our lecture with today that was our motivating question. We know, by looking at the characteristic polynomial, that the eigenvalues are roughly three, five, seven, and nine. In fact, we have the following row sums. Row 1 here is the sum over the first row. Row 2 here is the sum over the second. Row 3 is the sum over the third. And row 4 is the sum over the fourth. 
we now see that rho of a, the max of these, is 9.3. Similarly, we can consider the column sums. Nu sub 1 is the sum over the first column. Nu sub 2 is the sum over the second. Nu sub 3 is the sum over the third. And nu sub 4 is the sum over the fourth. Here you'll see that nu of a, the column sum, should be the max of these, and in this case it is 9.2. Now the theorem says that each eigenvalue satisfies its absolute value should be less than the min of these, so should be less than or equal to 9.2. Actually, we've already computed each of the eigenvalues, and we see that this is a pretty good estimate in this case. The largest eigenvalue is lambda sub 4, which is 9.03. In absolute value, this is indeed less than 9.2. We're going to end today's lesson with what's called the Dirschgorn disk theorem. It's going to give us an even better way to approximate the eigenvalues of a given matrix. Recall that if A is an n by n squared matrix, the eigenvalues must be the root of this characteristic polynomial. Well, Let's make the following construction. Recall that rho sub i is the sum over rho i of our matrix A. A sub i i is the entry along the diagonal that is in rho i column i of our matrix. Let's consider the set of complex numbers z such that the absolute value of z minus a i i is less than or equal to rho i of a minus the absolute value of AII. This is actually a disk centered at AII and has radius rho i minus the absolute value of AII. Recall that we identify the complex numbers as actually points in the real plane. The statement of this theorem is that each eigenvalue lies in at least one of these disks CI. The CIs are what are called Gershgorn disks. As one quick observation, notice that if zero is not in any of the disks, then our matrix A must be invertible. Now, let's try to give a geometric interpretation of what's happening here. Each of the disks you would see as a yellowish blob on your screen. It will be centered at a point AII, Remember that AII is actually a complex number, but we're going to plot this depending upon its real component and its imaginary component. So it'll be centered here somewhere in one of these yellow blobs. The radius of the yellow blob is the real number, rho i of a minus the absolute value AII. Again, that would tell you the radius of the disk that you see here. These yellow disks themselves are the CIs the x would be our eigenvalue lambda. And the point is that the eigenvalue would have to lie in at least one of these disks. So if we have information about the disks, namely where they are centered and their radii, then we can get a pretty good idea of where the eigenvalues, in this case, is where the x's are plotted. Let's give an example of this. Again, let's return to our 4 by 4 matrix where we've computed the four eigenvalues. Recall that the Gershgorn disks are defined as the following CI. We're going to identify a complex number z as a point x comma y by writing z as x plus i y. First, the elements along the main diagonal, a i i, would be 3, 5, 7, and 9. Next, we can compute the row sums of our matrix A as row sub 1 is 3.5, row 2 is 5.3, row 3 is 7.3, and row 4 is 9.3. Finally, we can compute our Gershgorn disks as the set of complex numbers, namely x comma y, such that the absolute value z minus aii should be less than a certain radius. Notice that aii really are real numbers, so the absolute value of z minus aii really corresponds to the square root of, say, x minus 3 squared plus y squared, or x minus 
5 squared plus y squared, and so forth. The rho i of a minus the absolute value of a i i will give us the radius. So for example, for c1, the radius is 3.5 minus 3, which is just 0 0.5. So we can think of c1 as a disk centered at the point 3 comma 0 that has radius 1 half. C sub 2 is a disk centered at the point 5 comma 0, and it has radius 0 0.3. In this way, we actually see that our eigenvalues do indeed lie in at least one of these disks. For example, lambda sub 1 lies in the disk C1, lambda 2 lies in the disk C2, lambda 3 lies in the disk C3, and lambda 4 lies in the disk C4. Thanks for watching.